I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Of America. Crazy people would kill everybody here if they could. We know people who have no place on the planet if you're different than they are. It's about people who take women in the soccer stadium and kill them for sport. And if you think that won't come your way, then you need to get a history book. So count me in for winning the war. No matter how long you serve. I'm going to answer. The only reason we haven't had another 9-11 is because we've been after these bastards all over the world.
We know you're here because you care about uh, what happens in this community of both sides of the aisle. And uh, I obviously know this. I'm very proud invited the majority leader, Senator Harry Reid, to be here today. And his leadership would make a very big difference in this debate if he would come forward to work on both sides of the aisle to get this done. And our president, who's the commander in chief, to come forward because we are willing to work with both sides of the aisle. Uh, but this is an issue that is too important to our country to just let happen or to be used, by the way, as a bargaining chip in another debate. Really, this, in my view, is way too important. And this is something that cries out for resolution before the election. Because if you wait till after the election, this is hanging over the heads of our military. And as Senator McCain mentioned, there are a lot of jobs at stake as well. And our, certainly our Department of Defense is not a job program, but if our men and women in uniform don't have the very best equipment and can't rely on the very best technology, then we are not in the position we should be. We are not keeping faith with them and making sure that they have what they need. And that is produced in the private sector. And our defense industrial base is a partner and a very important part to making sure that our men and women have what they need. And what, is, what does it mean for jobs in this country? Overall, the estimate of the report run by George Mason University, a million jobs. As Senator McCain said, 4,200 jobs estimate in Nevada. In my home state of New Hampshire, it's, uh, it's a 3,000 jobs. So this is a very important issue to every state in this nation. So we appreciate uh, your comments here today, and we look forward to answering your questions. And it's my honor to introduce uh, Colonel Lindsey Graham, <laughs> who is uh, the senator from South Carolina. Thank you. There's really not a whole lot there. I'm dying to get your questions. Uh, what? Thanks for coming out. Uh, to the school, thank you for allowing us to use the school in the venue. Um, to those who came out who are very good at this and trying to understand more about why we're here, I really do appreciate it. Of all the issues that are working in America, this one probably the least understood and the most dangerous. You know, I've been in the Air Force for 30 years. I'm a military warrior, so they don't let me around anything that goes fast, which is good. You know, the only people I think that ever wanted to kill me were probably my clients. But see, they are proving now that Mel, Mel, you understand what Mel does for the Air Force? Mel's department could be held as a ship to make some of us raise tax rates. Well, we're not going down that road. You know, President Obama takes the frustration by, by raising the top rate. Half of it came from raising the top rate, and half came from spending without the government. The House takes the frustration by studying food stamps and other programs. We had a plan that predicted when three federal employees retire over the next decade, only hire two back. There are three different plans. Nobody's in a room trying to bring it together. And this is where we need leadership from Republican leaders, Democratic leaders, and the President himself. The President spoke about the devastation done to our farmers. Have you been following the drought? Our farmers need an office now. Because I cannot emphasize enough, it's not Kelly and Lindsay and me that are saying this. It's our uniform leaders and it's our Secretary of Defense that are saying we won't be able to defend this nation. What could be more important? And, I, and the thing that's a little frustrating is that not enough Americans are aware of this, the seriousness of this challenge. So all I can tell you is um, I, I think we have to have the American people demand that we do it. And so I can't really give you a definitive answer. You want to say well, there'll never be 60 Republicans in the Senate, no matter what happens. And the Republican Party has as much plan for this as the Democratic Party. It takes two to hang on this issue. So what I would like to see happen is that Mel Air Force, are you listening, people here? Mel Air Force State's future is very much at risk here. If this happens, Mel Air Force State will no longer be what it is today. And that is true of all the major events in uh, this question. So what will Romney do? Romney says he didn't like the sequestration as it was constructed. Well, that's good to know. But how 
do we avoid? This is August. No one is in a room trying to fix this. Harry issued a press statement about us coming. I like it. We all get along our best we can. And at the end of the day, um, I hope the idea that we would use devastating defense cuts as a bargaining chip for a debate on taxes would make most Americans sick. But no matter what you think about these wars, the men and women who've been fighting them deserve better than that. And I can tell you, if the Iranians get a nuclear weapon, everything we know today is going to change dramatically overnight. It will send the Mideast into chaos. And they're hell-bent to get a nuclear weapon. And I hope sanctions work. But let me tell you, if they don't work, it will be the American air power not the Israeli air power that can stop the Iranians completely. Israel can do some damage to the Iranians, but we have the ability to do tremendous damage to their desires to give them nuclear weapons. That ability over time will be lost in the future. And for those who yearn for peace, the best way to maintain peace is to have people afraid to go to war with the United States. I want to be an agent for peace, but I want to have a military that people on their right mind will not take on. I remember when I graduated from Notre Dame and got commissioned as an engine, we were headed towards that 600 ship Navy. I look around today and I look at the 285 ship fleet, and it does concern me a lot. It also concerns a lot of the constituents that I follow. There are two major concerns. One is that they know the cuts are going to come, but they don't want us to get the military to work on our capacity to do what we need to do. The second concern is that they want to make sure that we don't forget the president, especially those who have been injured and are going to need help for the next 50 to 60 years of their life. I wonder if you can address that. Well, Chris, first, before you go, uh, we have a question for you. As a Navy man, how the hell did you end up here? Well, thanks for your service, uh, Chris. Maybe tell you. Uh, I would say, well, first of all, this, this issue of if we, in terms of our veterans coming home, the way you should know that the way the presentation does work is that the veterans health care piece of it is exempt from it right now. Uh, that's the way the law is written. But that said, uh, there's no question that you can't put our, our forces in a position where if you hollow out, you know, from you hollow out the force, then you make it more dangerous for our forces. And you make it riskier for them if they don't have the equipment that they need. When you don't have, when, you're ask, when you ask people to do things, and you don't give them what they need, the equipment they need, that's the real danger here when we think about how we're not our force, because it means people's lives uh, at risk. And I think that that's, that's one of the concerns, the, the deepest concerns that I have uh, about where we are. Um, and in terms of veterans health care, we, we're going to have a, a big challenge going forward with, uh, with our men and women who are coming home and to serve. Uh, they are amazing, great individuals, and we need to be safe for them, uh, based on what they've done for our country. Uh, but that, that's... I serve as the active duty Marine Corps, and I was a veteran in the first Gulf War. I'm also uh, a police officer, a former police officer, who served for many years in that capacity. I'm not anti-military, I'm not anti-security, however, from my own experience in the First Gulf War, we had a workforce that was based upon a peacetime military. So we went into Kuwait and we kicked their, excuse my French, we kicked their asses. And the Senator from New Hampshire described the situation in which the Marine Corps being pared down to a force size of, say, 190,000. I was part of that 190,000. And we did what we were supposed to do, okay? The sequestration situation that we have today is a part of the 
whole debt ceiling crisis a strong arm tactic that led to your body trying to figure out a long-term solution. A long-term solution because the debt that hangs over all these families has to be dealt with. As a result, the pain's got to be felt equally on both sides. I'm totally for a strong military. However, the military has been feeding at the trough of the taxpayer for 10 long years. Boys without you. And it concerns me as a private citizen today and a veteran that these wars, they last forever. But the majority of the people that serve in these militaries, we have now, are the poor and the middle class. They do the fighting, they do the dying, they are the wounded, and the scarred from these things. And they're forgotten. You should have your um, hearing for this thing over at the new veterans facility that's over on Hand Road. That's more of a reflection of what's been going on for the last 10 years. I'm totally for supporting our military. But we got to drive forward on two fronts. Achieve victory in warfare, but at the same time, not to hold our children hostage. And the, the, the debt has to be dealt with. Uh, so I just ask, and I, I respect you all, especially Mr. Or Senator McCain, greatly, that we can all work together. It's just, I have a hard time swallowing a lot of these facts and figures that you're putting out here, just from my own experience. Uh, well, I know that um, others want to comment. First of all, thank you for your service, and also thank you for your service as a police officer. I was an attorney general before this, and uh, that's a tough, tough job. Uh, let me just say that certainly you hit on an incredibly important point, uh, which I've gotten a mother of a four-year-old and seven-year-old, so I don't usually like them to come to other states I don't represent, but uh, this issue is so important for me. That's why I'm here today. And, but this issue of the debt, no question, it is as uh, certainly when Admiral Mullen was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he said it's the, one of the greatest national security threats to our country is our debt. When we did this deal on the debt ceiling, we left most of the spending on the table. So what happens is we left over 60% of what we spend our money on uh, on the annual basis in the federal government on the table. And we left it to, you know, 30 plus percent to make all the cuts. And so, the, as Senator McCain said in the opening, so 19% of our federal spending is defense. And it's going to take 50% on the cuts. And not defense spending, taking, we didn't talk about that today, but it's going to take the other 50%. Because we didn't budget, because we don't deal with the big picture of what are the drivers of, of our our debt, and as Senator Graham said, the mandatory spending programs that are on autopilot, and if we don't show some courage there on a bipartisan basis and address those, we're going to continually be in this cycle. And with respect to our military, you know, I think the assistant commandant is word when he says that this, in terms of our Marine Corps, even going back to the Gulf War, and in, in comparing that this is really when the Marine Corps are unable to respond. To a single baby contingency, which, you know, I, they're the exchange of the men and women, of course, that we need to take the expert advice from. Uh, we don't look for savings and defense, and we are going to reduce $487 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, but to take a disproportionate cut from our defense at a time when the other the challenges we face around the world aren't getting any easier, I think is, is a foolish and short sighted decision because, as you know, Every time we have gone down in the past, whether it's in Korea or whether you looked at it in the early 90s, we've had to ramp back up, and then the costs of doing that have been even greater in terms of our military and what it has cost us to do. Um, and finally, you know, we're, all of us here, we all want to do, certainly we want to do as much reform as possible, whether it's acquisition reform we depend on, we know that there are changes that can be made there in terms of finding savings, but it's not going to get us to a trillion dollars from the next. 
uh, 10 years when you combine the reduction of Germany made and the 500 billion on top of it. So I would uh, Well, let's just be honest. You serve uh, your country, you serve non essential. There is no way in hell you're going to balance the budget without a job. 50 something percent of the money we spend is in time. Medicare and Medicaid alone in 20 years from, from all the revenue coming in to the federal government. The baby boomers, my generation, are retiring at about 10,000 a day or a month. I can't remember the number. And there are two, three workers for every Social Security recipient when I was born and did back there with 16. The awards have been about a trillion dollars. How long they go on is not the issue for me, it's how they end. You know, if you if you got a magic timetable of where we fight to this day and we quit, we're going to lose every war. We didn't start this damn thing. Remember how it started? It started when Afghanistan fell into the hands of crazy people who would kill everybody in here if they could. Remember what this war is about. It's about people who have no place on the planet if you're different than they are. It's about people who take women in the soccer stadium and kill them for sports. And if you think that won't come your way, then you need to get a history book. So count me in for winning the war. No matter how long you're I'm going to answer this question about the budget. Look at the amount of money we spend on the fence in terms of gross domestic product. We've been at war now for 10 years. It's on the low end since World War II. 24% increase from 2008 and 10 on non-defense spending. We've doubled the size of the Department of Education, and we've had real cuts in the military. So count me in for cutting the military, but by God, we're also going to do something on the other side. And it's going to take two to tango here. So when you look at the facts about what we're spending on our military, it is not disproportionate, it's on the low end. And the Air Force that I'm proud to be part of, these guys have been flying and fighting for 10 years. During World War II, everybody went to the fight, and none of young men's got a point here. Only 1% fought this war. Most of us have been unaffected. But during the 10 years of flying and fighting, we reduced the Air Force. World War II, we built it up. Now you're talking about while the war is still going on, and another one on the verge of coming about of actually gutting the military. That's not how you balance the budget, because there will be no social security without national security. There will be no way of life if the people that were fighting are able to roam the globe freely and impose their will on others. So the numbers regarding defense men are not just But I am, as a Republican, willing to do things that some people in my party said we shouldn't do. And that is close the deduction of our loophole and take that money and avoid sequestration. The Grover Northwood pledge, I'm willing to say that's not appropriate now when you're sixteen trillion dollars in debt. I'm willing to take deduction off the table for the key by ethanol. Take that money back in and pay down the debt and make sure we don't destroy the military. We just need partners on the other side. Can I also add that if you took all the defense study, including the war study, it would barely get you over half the deficit last year. So we can't even get half the deficit. If we took it all, we spent nothing on protecting our country. So to put in perspective of why if we don't get the assessment piece of it and really put the priorities there and reform them, reform those programs so that they're actually there for those who are relying on them too because they're, they're going bankrupt. Yeah. Hi, Mary Lou Anderson from Las Vegas. And for supper, I like all three of you all have a job to do. I'm definitely a kind of point. Um, let's remember what the war is about. Let's get real, let's get real about what the war is about. The war is about money. The war is about making money. The tour the three of you are on is about the presidential election. Mr. McCain voted for the law that approves sequestration. Respect the three of you. I know you all respect our group on this law. Well. The gentleman before me stated it much more eloquently than I did. I mean, I'm happy, personally happy, that the crowd is no longer 
I thicken by the amount of money we spend on the election process in a whole. And that is bipartisan. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I wish more people were here so they could hear the voice in front of us, but believe the money really does need to be rededicated to the human services program. Some of the stats, some of the stats that people don't know, and correct me if I'm wrong, we spend two billion plus on about two point three billion per day in military money. We spend under three million a day in human services programs. There are people in this room who are unemployed. There are people who are on the street. Alright? The politicalness of it has got to go away. The three of you are strong in what you do. You have ears in the military. You are a PSW. I respect you. You and your family have been involved in politics for years. I mean, when are we going to cut the shit? And no disrespect, but we've got to stop. We've got to stop. This is not a bipartisan effort. This is a partisan effort. And the fact of the matter is, you know what, there's somebody up here who can tell us specifically why we need to dump more money, as an example, in the Creek Airport Bay. This is right down the street from us. We need to dump more money into the Oscar Creek. I spent two weeks in Afghanistan last year. We don't need to dump any more money into the drone program that's killing us in civilian in Afghanistan. Uh, okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm being shut down. Uh, you know, uh, you are, right? uh, okay. You haven't asked a question. No. Mr. McCain said we don't have to ask questions. We can respond to ask questions. So I hope we need, we need to have some deficit. I think we need to take an honest look as a bipartisan group as to how we do that and not scam the American public and scare the American public into believing we are the United States. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to mention uh, about Afghanistan, if I could. To remind you, even though it's been a long time, the attacks of 9-11 originated in Afghanistan. And it's because the Taliban took over and they cooperated with Al-Qaeda and the attacks were originated in Afghanistan. Yeah, so That's why did we go to Iraq to go to yeah. war for 10 years before we got to Afghanistan? You know, so I'm sure that we allow people to stand in, in, in line and ask us questions and make comments and we really don't appreciate it if you're rude by yelling because then that destroys the whole kind of process. But um, but I just finally went out and I thank you for, Madam, for your passionate uh, views and I respect them that if Afghanistan again evolves into Taliban control, every expert I know believes that Al-Qaeda would return and we know what Al-Qaeda does. We learned that on 9-11. So I hope that, that we can appreciate the fact that the reason why we went there was a compelling reason because of the needless deaths of thousands of innocent American citizens. If I could just add, I want to compliment the Obama administration for the aggressive people from it. They have gone after a uh, very vicious enemy that's trying to find a safe haven all over the world. I'm glad that President Obama ordered the uh, attack on my lot of American citizens who have been firing people to kill Americans like the major. I am very, you know, even though I would like to be president, I, I very much appreciate what President Obama has done with the drone program because it is a way to keep the enemy off balance the next day. And if you've got any love in uh, Afghanistan, you're certain most of the IEDs are coming out of Pakistan. The drone program allows us to intercept and interdict and stop terrorist plots from coming our way. So, Bottom line, I disagree basically with what the lady said, and I do want a bipartisan solution. I'm not asking for us to fix this all overnight. Let's just get four months off the table. Let's don't start the next Congress with this hanging over our head. And as a Republican, I'm willing to raise revenue to fix the problem, but not tax rates. Did you believe in the Princeton Bowls I do? What did they do? They eliminated all the deductions to the trillion dollars, 1.2 trillion a year. They took the money and they applied it to lower tax rates to create jobs and paying off debt. Let's use that same model. There's some tax. I'm willing to eliminate 
corporate jet deduction. They take that money and you know, only provide a jet I'm willing to eliminate the wealthy captain deduction, but I'm sure the wealthy captain will appreciate that. But there's plenty of things in the tax code that we could do away with. We take that money, we'll give it to a few people, and apply it to problems uh, like sequestration. And to her point about sequestration, do you know if you have a special needs child? Do you know anyone with a special needs child? Let me tell you, the education budget gets this hard here. Special needs programs are very much at risk. This idea of cutting across the board blindly is not the idea. Sir? My name is Devin Duvall. I'm a uh, a lot of people I notice given uh, on the street press that don't think that uh, a person can die to an opinion unless they uh, get in the military. So I should say before I start that I am a veteran. And one thing I learned in the military is that our war is young men dying for old men's war. And that's how it's always been. That's how it is today. Now, in your state, Senator McCain, in our state, people are getting kicked off Medicaid, food stamps, at one of the nation's highest foreclosure rates. The people in the state of Arizona are never heard of. And here you are running around telling us, warning us that we have to keep spending $2 billion a day on military, war profiteering, on an optionally manned nuclear capable next gen bomber. The people in Arizona want to know, Senator McCain, what the hell is wrong with you? The people in your state need you. For example, you've taken a strong position on the uh, corporations and our people issue. Well, help us in Prescott to get our city council to just pass the corporations and not people resolution. There are lots of things you need to be doing for the community and the people in Arizona instead of this tour of fear that you're embarked on. That's all I got to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I uh, have obligations in the United States Senate and among those are to try to make sure that the men and women in the military are trained and equipped and able uh, to defend this nation. Uh, I don't expect you, obviously, from what you had to say, to take my word for it, but I hope you would respect the Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, who is not a Republican, who said that if these uh, draconian sequestration takes place, it would destroy our ability to defend the nation. No, I do not respect well, I'm fine if you don't respect yeah. it, but, but I think most Americans do respect well, it. The only people he's speaking for are the war profiteers, the defense contractors that want to continue to make it all the weapons systems that we don't need and that we'll never use. Well, that's right. If, if you have a view of Secretary Panetta, I respect that view. Yes, thank you. you. But I, I really don't believe that most Americans share that view of Secretary Panetta or his predecessor. Secretary Gates. Um, in fact, Secretary Panetta is a different party of mine, uh, but I happen to work closely with him and respect his views enormously and his leadership. So, again, uh, we, we just have a difference of opinion. I respect that opinion. That's why we have these events to listen, and I listen carefully to everything you and your, and your friend there said, and it makes us uh, understand better the views that many people have. That's why we have these events. I just wanted to say, um, please understand, when we, we talk about these across the board, um, the domestic side is going to take the 500 billion as well. Um, and as Senator Grant said, if you put the two together, the problem with it is that we need to, we need to reduce that. We no question. But when you do it in an across the board way, then you don't prioritize, you don't say, well, we need to help them get special education more, we need to help cancer research more, as opposed to something else that's not as productive, it's just across the board for everything. And the solutions we are asking people to come to the table for, and the solution we propose, the three of us up here, um, 
use the whole time for this. And so it comes up with ways to, to replace the sequester with such reductions that actually deal with both sides of this. And so our focus isn't just in the solution being we all serve on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, we are here to talk about the military impact, but please understand uh, that, that the solution is going to deal with both sides of it. <coughs> and that the, the way that this moves forward on a bipartisan basis is that we find the way to address our debt um, and not a mean act, and not across the board, but prioritize it in the way that we should. And I, and I would say this as well. You want to talk about an impact in this community. Um, I have no doubt that people are hurting here, people are hurting across the country. And we have spent a lot more on food stamps. We've, we've invested, if you look at the percentage increase on food stamps, it's very dramatic. That said, 40, we went to visit Dallas. Here's the number. Between the military, civilian, families, it's 41,000 uh, just from the impact of Dallas. And it's roughly 6,500 jobs. And just because of the people from around the world that will come to participate in exercises at Nellis, it's 88,000 who actually go in this area will come and visit Nellis from other countries and other places. 88,000 use the hotel rooms here. Just follow it all out. Whether it's the person who's a waiter at the hotel, or whether it is someone who works for a company that supports the bay, um, this if things are hurting here, this will hurt here even more. Now, we're here to talk about the national security impact, but there's no question that there are other impacts to this community from people who uh, work very diligently to support not only the base, uh, but perform other, any other uh, functions that, that, are, that are supported by the, even the people who come and visit the base from other countries. So, so this will have an impact on the community of those who are hurting, unfortunately. And there's got to be a better way, and there is a better way to take our part of the to get it done. We, have, we are close out of time, but I know those two remaining uh, speakers, so please go ahead. We are really are going to only have to allow the last two weeks spend close to an hour in the house, and go right ahead, so yes, sir. I'm Kelby Johnson. I was 32 and a half years in the Air Force. As a matter of fact, the last time I was this close to Sergeant McCain, I was about two to three thousand feet above you 40 years ago. God bless you. Why didn't you come get me? <laughs> 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 Thanks for sitting. We tried to make all the noise we could. Seriously, in 1972, the last time I was here, we not that. Thank you. I, I do, like some of the others, appreciate you being out here to try and highlight not only this issue of sequestration, but overall defense issues. And I love some of the, the terms that Senator Graham used because we are coast. I got to spend time in Vietnam, the Korea, the final over Iraq and a number of other places, and again, have the force to be with our Air Force for 32 and a half years. And lastly, in the same position as uh, Jeff Lofton, who you met earlier today, 10 years ago, I got that on. It's so important for you to get here trying to explain not only what this is because of the jeopardy this country will be in, but overall defense issues and overall economic issues. Because as our country, as this, I think, even points out that it's looking so much more closely into a necklace shrug type culture that it's only about the and not about the overall welfare of our country. My two specific questions are there's been debate about whether the Warren Act was actually going to do anything to accelerate that's the game line when you were out here. There has been some discussion recently, I think you said agree, but I'm not sure, that said, no, the warning is, is not going to affect how people will have to receive the layoff notices on the 1st of November in order to make a one January separation of loss of employment. Uh, do you think of the fact that the Warren Act is there is going to help your cause? And let me tell you what the Warren Act is. The Warren Act is a federal law that requires people who may lose their job because of cuts in the federal budget, particularly in the defense area, to be notified so they can plan. In 2007, Senator Obama tried to expand the notice to 90 days. 
It was a Warren Act plus. Fair noted that. He, he and Senator Clinton wanted to make sure that people who were subject to being laid off because of cuts in the defense industry would be put on notice so they could get their lives in order. Well, where do we have today? Here's what the law requires. It requires 60 day notices in some states, 90 day notices, by every contractor who may be forced to lay somebody off because of the defense cut to sequestration. Guess when the 90 60 day period is? The Friday before the election. Lockheed Martin, several years ago, failed to send out the warrant notices, and they had, I think, a couple thousand, if not more, employees they had to let go because of previous defense cut. And they had to pay the 60 day wages for the fund. If you're the defense industry out there today and you believe that you will be affected by sequestration, which is the law of the land unless somebody changes it, and you don't send these notices out, you're putting yourself at legal risk. So Harry Reid is dead wrong about this. They're afraid of these notices hitting Friday before the election. And when they start up this idea of sequestration, they included Republicans. So, we've had this gun and butter argument since time began. And count me in the account of wanting to make sure you do first things first. I've never known a time in history where the world was, was hurt by a strong America. A strong America has been a good thing for those who believe in freedom and tolerance. And that's debatable. So every time Americans got weaker, bad guys get stronger. Look at the 20s and 30s. We had these same speeches given by well-meaning people who were really superior. Lindbergh, a national hero, was going all over the world. You can do this with whatever. You don't need to worry about these people. You need to. You need to worry about. Them. You need to. You need to. You need to worry about the Iranians that need to worry about. I can't see the Israelis. I worry about I'm our tell you, They're going to kill you and wipe you off the map, and you happen to be the only Jewish state left. You'll take that seriously. Um, and I'm here to tell you, it's been over 10 years since 9 11, but the only reason we haven't had another 9 11 is because we've been after these bastards all over the world. <laughs> and we're going to say that. And we're going to have to take a look at this and not to So at the end of the day, the Warren Act should be followed, and any company that's affected by the Warren Act that does not send these notices out, you're doing your dis employees a disservice, and I think you're violating the law. Can, can I also add that you may be aware as well that the Department of Labor um, issued political appointees, the head of the Department of Labor issued a, a what's called an, a, an advisory opinion to these companies after they had said we have to follow the law, the Warren Act, they should be playoff notices from the Obama administration, and basically said, well, it would be inappropriate to issue the notices. I would follow up with what Senator Graham said and said that here's the problem with the Department of Labor's advisory opinion. Their own regulations say that they have no authority over the Warren Act, that they can't give you advisory opinions on the Warren Act, and so here we have, I know, a last minute political football to get these companies not to follow the law, but the law is there to allow the workers to plan. And the law is there for a purpose, and you've got to follow the law. And I would just add to what Senator Graham said, uh, this may be a, it's a total political move, but the law is what it is, and these issues, these notices have to go out. Finally, Lockheed Martin said they'll have to send out 140,000 notices. If you got any of that about what this will do to the defense industrial complex, and, and who first can talk about these folks with four volunteers? In my state, they need them. My resistance is they remember the MRAP. The Humvees were getting blown up. They were basically coughing. The MRAP was developed in South Carolina. They thousands of lives. And the people who developed those systems are not war profiteers. They're patriots. They work really hard. And it's nice to go to these plants that make these defensive weapons that save lives and have the soldiers come back and say thank you. So one, I don't think he's a problem here at all. I think the The executives are. And that's just what I am I just wish you would uh, talk to our local officials and convince them to come in such a forum where we can express ourselves. You've been very open. You've been, uh, uh, I mean, it's incredible. Thank you. Uh, I was criticized by 
some of the things that are happening, that, that you're doing, that feels like we're in Alice in Wonderland. We're to, we, we, we've heard all this preaching about the death, especially from Republicans, since uh, 1979, when Reagan started running for, uh, for president. And he even said, he even went a lot further than you did then, and said that it was immoral. Yes, he increased the debt from a, a trillion dollars to three trillion dollars by, by the end of the eight years that he was in office. And now it's, it's, it's almost 16 trillion dollars, uh, which is more than our GNP. Uh, and uh, we're running a deficit of a trillion and a half dollars a year. Where are we getting that money? We're getting that money by declaring war on the entire world where we can ship our dollars and the rest of the world is forced to take those dollars because of the bread and wood agreement at the end of World War II, uh, made in your state, by the way, um, uh, to, to that, that the dollar is the international currency. China is being forced to buy $2 billion every day from the United States just to keep their, their economy. It's creating huge economic problems in China having to buy so many dollars. They now accumulated about three trillion dollars. The, the national debt of a trillion and a half dollars is far more grave than any uh, any uh, threat that we stand from a foreign country. That's that's just laughable that any country is going to attack it. Mm -hmm. Every country. Uh, as we have Industries here, we have an industry, particularly here in Las Vegas, that could receive Chinese people. But our own government, because of this war hungry on the part of, of the Congress, Harry Reid included, that Chinese are a terrorist threat, that Chinese can't get visas. Only about two million, out of billion, three hundred million Chinese have visas to come to the United States. With that, we, uh, we just if five million Chinese came to Las Vegas, they would spend uh, about five times as much as that loss that you have up here, six hundred billion dollars, six hundred million, six hundred million dollars. They would spend, they would, they have, they have increased the income of a cow, which no Chinese person would pay for cow over Las Vegas. It's more difficult to go to Macau. They have to get a special permit from the government. They did not go to Hong Kong on the same trip. They can only get that permit three times or four times a year. There are no permits that are required to come to Las Vegas. And yet, our own government, thanks to our Congress and our President, does not allow these people to come because they might be terrorists. And, and Macau now makes $36 billion a year with their gaming. Las Vegas makes $6 billion. Eight years ago, we were the same. This is a sort of Alice in Wonderland. But not, uh, China has one old aircraft carrier that they picked up, that was a barge over, that they got over in Russia. That's the only, that's the only aircraft carrier that has their whole navy. To think that they would come over here and attack the United States is just totally absurd. But you are creating a real danger for our country with your economic policy and shuffling all this money all over the world and forcing people to say Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. And obviously, you have a lot of facts and figures, and uh, obviously, you studied this issue in significant depth. I would just respond by saying that I don't envision a war with China. I don't enjoy condition and confrontation with China. But I do believe that a strong America, the strong alliances in the region, will help bring some restraint to the behavior that China is exhibiting almost every day as regards to the South China Sea. With Vietnam, they cut a cable. With the Philippines, they prevented one of the Philippine ship from leaving an area. They just announced that they have elected some kind of parliament on one of these uh, areas and um, they uh, and when you look at the official figures as to what China is spending on defense, my friend, it's far different from what they are actually spending. Now the Vietnamese lived for two thousand years under the Chinese. Who are our new best friends? Right? 
Yes, because they were scared to death of the Chinese behavior, which they believe threatens them. I'm not speaking of the United States. I just know too many Vietnamese officials who are very worried because of the long history that they have. The Philippines now are very concerned because of this dispute of the South China Sea. And again, I want to repeat that China is a world power. They're a world power. And the question is, is how does China behave as a world power? And in my view, the best way to ensure that that is a way that they are cooperative and contributing major power in the world is to make sure that we have strong alliances, that we have a strong military presence, and that our uh, presence in the region is, uh, would put the brake on some of the ambitions that the Chinese have. And I want to just finally say, the reason why America is a great nation is today is because we have always observed, among other reasons, uh, is that we've always observed freedom of navigation in international waters. We have never allowed for that to be curtailed anywhere because of the implications of it. The Chinese are now drawing a dashed line in the South China Sea and talking about their sovereignty of that part of the world. We cannot allow that to happen. And the best way to combat that is to friends and alliances and strength in the region. So I respect your opinion. I don't disagree with many of the facts that, that you state. But I can also say that I agree with President Obama strongly when he has announced a policy where we will increase our military presence in the region. And I think most Americans uh, would support the President Obama's policy there, too. I know that my two colleagues and I... Hey, you bring up a really good point. Dave, Dave Jew Island. I think I know we've got to go. The is very good for information. I think it's a thuggish regime. Uh, I have very little, a lot of respect for the Chinese people but very little respect for the regime. Remember the blind gentleman? Why was, why was he in jail? Because he wanted to stand up and meet and say, you know, I don't like the fact that the government forces people to have abortions, which is pro-life pro choice. That's kind of a draconian way of doing business. Uh, Syria, Russia and China and Tito, revolution after revolution, and the people of Syria from being slaughtered. If you're looking for China to, to buy into the freedom agenda and the idea of people having to chart their own destiny and forget it, they don't have questions. You've got just a handful of people taking the next leader. But they are a world power. We can do business with them. But if you go to Nellis and you ask about threat facing our nation, they'll mention China's exporting and technology. The Chinese build a lot of weapons. Not so much that they're going to come and bomb us, but they're going to sell their technology to almost any willing buyer. People, people really have to come to grips with the opportunity to counter presents as well as the danger. And President Obama and John McCain are right about this. We need to stand up to China. We need to speak truth to power. Anytime you're more worried about money, and that's your point further than you're about what's right, we need to speak loudly and boldly against the human rights violations in China, regardless of how much money they borrow from us, and we have an unhealthy relationship with China. They are financing our national debt. That's why we need to get out of debt so we don't depend on China, and that's why we need energy independence. We don't have to buy oil from people who hate us. These are the two things that we really push for strongly in the bipartisan fashion. And the last point is about attacking the nation. The 9-11 attack cost less than a million dollars. The 19 hijackers were all the students who were state of the They spent very little money playing the attack, and they killed 3,000 Americans. And the reason they used airplanes is because they couldn't find anything bigger to use. The threats we face are different. We're not fighting a nation state. There is no capital to conquer, no air force to shoot down, no navy to send. That doesn't mean you don't need an air force and a navy. So the people who wish us harm are trying to improve their weaponry. And one of the reasons we've got to push back against China and Russia is because they're the source of a lot of these weapons. And we are the source of a lot of their weapons. We're the source of that if Iran develops a nuclear capability, they may not put a bomb on top of the missile that goes to Jerusalem, but they will share this technology with some terrorist groups. And the only reason that
thousands of died in the war on terror and not made because they can't get the weapons to kill them. That's the challenge of our time. Really sure, is because of your eloquence, I will let you, even though we're aware of the time, I know you want to respond very quickly, and then I want to thank everybody for coming. Go ahead, please. You're great. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say you're very right about the South China, the China Sea situation. It's a total outrage. This, those items certainly don't belong to China. But this is totally out of character for China. And I think it's due to our to the aggressive reports that we put out every year declaring them a possible enemy. And, and this problem has to be solved by a diplomatic channel. And there has to be a way to it. But you're totally right. That, that's just the truth. Thank you, sir. Can I just say thank you for coming and uh, it's great to be back in our neighboring state and uh